Hello everyone, today is Sunday, January 31st, 2021. Uh, we're just going to talk about a couple uh, New York City crime stories once again. Because we know how it works in New York with the uh, with the media, unfortunately. Uh, in fact, I just got to close out a tab very quickly. There we go. On the fly. But... On New York one again, they barely mention anything about the crime. Uh, crime has just become a real epidemic in our state. Uh, you know what it is. It's been like this now for a while, thanks to bail reform. Uh, nothing else is going to change, but uh, the media just refuses to talk about it because uh, you know what they're focused on. Coronavirus, 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 coronavirus. I'm like, enough. You know, we have a crime problem. You know, we're reverting back to what New York City was back in 1981. You know why I'm bringing that up? Because this is the 40-year anniversary of the most violent year in New York City history. We may be on edge for that right now. Because uh, everybody's acting like everything is fine. Everything is fine. We're working from home. Working from home. Yeah, well, what about the statistic of being in a violent crime? You know, th that's the problem. So a lot we're going to get into, but um, I figured since the media hasn't been spending enough attention on um, what's going on in my city council district. I mean, New York One did a good job covering it. They spent about two minutes um, getting into uh, the background of the election, so... um. We're going to watch a video shortly, but a lot of crime has been going on, and we, we really have to discuss this because um, Pine Power LI, um, he's been doing a great job talking about Long Island issues lately. Um, I'm very disturbed, once again, to hear what's going on in Long Island. Um, there's a bunch of stories uh, not being reported uh, in Long Island, and, um, you know, I really wish that... Uh, News 12 was purchased by the Dolans again because uh, Altice should just go burn themselves down under. I'm not going to say what down under is because then uh, you know what heaven is and then you know the other H word. And the other H word is where Altice should go. That, that's all I'm going to say. Oh my god, you know. I mean, I just don't have any other thing to say about Altice. Just like how... I'll just mention that... You know, New York won... Ever since they've been bought out by Spectrum, it, it, it's the same thing. You know... New York won has not been the same channel... Uh, since... Time Warner Cable... Began their channel, you know? Th that's the problem. I, I just feel that... You know, ever since Charter got involved and they rebranded it to Spectrum, you know, I'm just completely upset with how they think that they can just manipulate Time Water Cable. And, you know, I really think Time Water Cable should come back. You know, they really should. You know, Spectrum should just do the same thing with Altice, you know. Because I'm just, again distraught with what's going on with the crime and you know what we'll get into what's going on so um let's get into the video for um city council district 24 right now the way of selecting the winner has changed and first-time candidates like Dilip Nath are happy about it i'm very excited for the rank choice voting i think this is given opportunity um, someone like me run for office and it will bring a diversity and inclusion that are so much needed in New York City. In the first ever ranked choice voting election in New York, eight candidates are running to fill the city council seat vacated by Councilman Rory Lansman, who recently took a job with the Cuomo administration. District 24 includes the Queens neighborhoods of Kew Garden Hills, Fresh Meadows, Briarwood and Jamaica. Six of those running are South Asian, a community that, like candidate Deepthi Sharma knows, has never had one of its members in the council. His representation matters, it is important, and 
that's how you create legislation that's actually going to be representative of the people that are um, that you're trying to represent. In this nonpartisan election on February 2nd, without traditional party labels, candidates come from all sides of the political spectrum. Momita Ahmed has earned the endorsement of the Working Families Party and a former candidate for governor, Cynthia Nixon. During a pandemic, when we're more closer to being homeless than billionaires, I think it's common sense to work for working class people, elderly people, um, uh, people who have lost their jobs during the pandemic. Some of her rivals are pledging to be more moderate, like Mujib Rahman. I'm not a socialist. I consider myself a conservative Democrat. And Jim Gennaro, who, after working for Governor Cuomo, wants to get back the city council seat he had for 12 years. He says experience matters. I would be a centrist, I would be a moderate. I think that is a perspective which is needed now even more than when I was in the council because uh, you know, many people have gone very, very far left. The other candidates in the race are Nita Jan, Michael Brown, and Soma Sied. The winner of this race will only serve in the city council till December 31st. There will be a partisan primary in June and a general election in November for this same seat. Juan Manuel Benitez, New York One. So once again, that was from New York One. Uh... I have to say, that was a good video. I, I just wish the other New York City channels would, you know, cover it. Since, again, this is a big deal. And I will mention there's another race coming up in the Bronx um, sometime later on in February. I think it's March, something like that. But you can always check the Board of, uh, Board of um, Elections website. They, they give more specific details. But, uh, again, I'm focusing on my... Um, district because again remember I live west of 188th Street and um, since I'm technically part of District 24 this does imply to me so uh, I do want to uh, give a little bit of what's going on here a little bit of background I guess um, I have brought up the fact that um, Roy Lantzman my old city councilman were assigned to take a job in the Cuomo administration, and um, they did mention that in the uh, in the video. So um, again, if I didn't mention it in the intro, um, today is the last day of early voting, but by the time this video gets out, uh, it won't even matter past the three o'clock deadline. Um, you can't really do an absentee at this point. The deadline was last week, but thankfully I got my absentee in the mail uh, two weeks ago almost. I did go to the post office this week to mail it out to so the Board of Elections in Forest Hills will hopefully count my vote. But um, I will mention for anybody who thinks it could be possible, um, the polls will be open on February 2nd from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, I will mention if you are still in line past 9 p.m., uh, don't give up. Because this is the first election we're using ranked choice voting, and I'll get into that in a second. Because, um, you know, I can't believe my city council district is the experiment for uh, what's to come later on in the primary in June. Because uh, there is going to be primary for um, controller, city council, obviously, um, mayor, public advocate. So there's a lot that's going to happen. You know, there's going to be a lot that will... Um, Fold, I think. So let me get into uh, the background for the election. <laughs> February 2nd special election for the City Council District 24 will be the first to utilize ranked choice voting, a voting system designed to give constituents vote more power when choosing their representative. The position became vacant after former City Councilman Roy Lantzman resigned to begin a new post as special counsel for ratepayer protection with the governor's office. The winning candidate will serve in the role until December 31st of this year. Now, they mentioned in the video that, um, keeping in mind that every four years, each city council seat is up for grabs. So, um, I was expecting Lanceman to, you know, stay in office for another year. And uh, since Lanceman was term limited, because he ran in um, 09, 13, and 17, 
Because in the city council, you can run for three terms. So I know, um, for an example, like uh, Karen Consulwitz in Kew Garden, she's term limited. Um, Barry Gradenchik, he's term limited, I think. I'm not too sure of that. But I know uh, Paul Ballone in uh, College Point, for an example, he's term limited. So, um, hang on. Let me find out if... Um, let me find out. That's a good question. If Barry Gredenchik is term limited this year. Here we go. Barry Gredenchik. Oh, okay. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. So, he is eligible to, um, write. I remember Repren was in the city council and then he became an assemblyman. No, my bad. I'm not thinking of the... Who am I thinking of? See, I'm so confused. I'm sorry. See, that's the problem. I just lose my mind easily. <laughs> right, so... Lanceman won in 2017. Alright, so... La uh, my bad. Right, Lanceman won in 2017. Okay, I'm just double-checking. Oh, okay, yeah. So, uh, Gredenchik is eligible. Okay, because that's the City Council District 23. Now, again, I'm in 24 because, again, I'm west of 188th Street. So, um, they mentioned the candidates in the video. Um, my old councilman, James Gennaro, um, he is running. And uh, James Gennaro was my um, city councilman um, when I first moved to Fresh Meadows in 2005. So, um, it would be interesting to have my old councilman back in the... Uh, Back in the sea he used to have. <laughs> but it certainly is possible. I wouldn't, um... I wouldn't rule it out because, um... For an example, Karen Consulwitz... Um... She was a councilwoman during the Giuliani administration. And then, um... During the tail end of the Bloomberg administration. And then going into de Blasio's, um... Administration. She was there too. So... Um, to go into ranked Joyce voting, what is it? So, um, what happens is, um, you can vote up to five candidates for an example, um, the first candidate, candidate you love, and then the candidate you like. So you don't really have to necessarily vote for five candidates. Um, I have spoken to a poll worker at the board of elections. I'm not going to say who it is. Um, just somebody who I know personally. Um, he had mentioned to me how it works, that you don't have to necessarily fill out five candidates. So I voted for two, for an example, to, you know, experiment with it. But um, this is going to give a lot of people, uh, you know, a lot of opportunities. So the good news is, um, if you still have an absentee that you have received, um, you have to make sure... That the ballots must be postmarked on or before February 2nd. So again, you have to make sure that your absentee is mailed out on or before February 2nd. Now again, for an example, I mailed mine out on Wednesday. So um, I mailed mine out on the 27th. So the Board of Elections in Forest Hills should hopefully get my ballot by now, hopefully. Um... You can still vote, once again, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. on February 2nd. Um, I don't know how that's going to... That's going to be interesting to see the voter turnout on Election Day because we're supposed to get a snowstorm. And again, I'll have coverage um, later tonight, obviously. Um, I may have to multitask with the Royal Rumble being on mute because uh, the weather's still going to be my top priority. Um, I'll just mention that. There's a pay-per-view later tonight. So, uh... I can multitask. It's certainly, uh, certainly there. But I'll leave this uh, article in the description below. I really want you to look at the candidates carefully. I mean, again, I'm not going to say who I voted for because then, you know, confidentiality. But it's important to, you know, understand how big the deal is. I mean, even though you may not live in City Council District 24, you need to understand 
that if we don't have more than 50% of the vote for one candidate alone, then we go to a runoff. So I've been hearing that there's a chance that maybe sometime later on in February or in March, there may be a um a way to have a runoff. But again, that's up to Mayor de Blasio and we'll figure that out. Anyhow, let's get to some good news. I know a lot of people aren't excited about it that much, but um, this is important to note here. So I'll zoom in so you all can see the article. See if I can zoom it in. There we go. All right. Governor Cuomo in a press conference on Friday announced that New York City restaurants can resume indoor dining at 25%. So that is a small step, but uh, it's all going to depend on what we do as a city. Because uh, I, I just got to say one thing. The Bronx has really got to get their act together. I mean, the Bronx just keeps seeing a high rate of coronavirus infection. And, you know, Queens has been so, so... We go up, we go down, but we could be a whole lot worse. I will say, Manhattan, keep up the good work. I mean, even though they were a low rate... Uh, I don't know how Manhattan's having a low rate of infection, but whatever you're doing in Manhattan, keep it up. Because Manhattan's doing a great job with the with the COVID spread, which is shocking. All right, so um, it's just sad to think that, you know, these restaurants keep closing. And I will mention Channel 7 was at one of my favorite diners in the city, believe it or not, the Bel Air and Astoria. So, um... Good news is uh, wedding venues can operate at 50% capacity. Now, that's interesting because um, I was talking to the mother of my cousin who was getting married supposedly in August. Um, I'm wondering if she invited more than 150 people because I know the wedding is in August, but the problem is you still have to get tested for COVID and... By August, you may have to prove that you got the coronavirus vaccine, which, um, again, I'll just mention for personal preference, I will get the vaccine when it's my turn. Um, the situation could be different with Johnson & Johnson. Uh, Novavax had mentioned that there may be another vaccine from them, but it's a two-shot one versus Johnson & Johnson. So, um... Again, I you, you got to keep the restaurants open. I mean, it's not fair that the rest of the state has had 50%. And, you know, we'll see what happens. But um, let's hope we don't have to shut down indoor dining again. Because I know there was a post-holiday spike. But um, the vaccine's kicking in. We are noticing it. The vaccine is starting to kick in. Only time will tell. So I just want to give the heads up that there's going to be a lot of news from Northwest Queens we need to cover because I'm just very disappointed with the media in terms of them not covering actual crime news in the Long Island City, Astoria area. I mean, I'm just praying for that part of Queens. It's, you know, awful to hear. But I will mention, um, I was at the dentist in um, Bayside on Thursday and they did have New York 1 on, and I wasn't going to ask to change the channel, because, you know, why would I want to do that? Especially if, you know, everything going on with COVID. But um, I will mention, they did bring this up. There was a water main break in Queensbridge. Yeah, Queensbridge. And uh, the New York City stations did a good job covering this too. Not just New York 1, but, you know, the other stations got involved. Alright, so this happened at Queensbridge back on Thursday. So, um... That is just upsetting to hear that this happened, uh... In the Queensbridge housing. Now, remember, it's a NYCHA building. So, that's controversial as it is. And, uh... The water main break happened at Vernon Boulevard and 41st Avenue. So, that is just... Very sad to hear. Mm -mm 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 -mm. And not to mention, there were people actually driving on the street 
and they were submerged in their cars. It's just completely upsetting, you know. But uh, this was this was a big deal. I mean, water was in cars. The residents in the buildings didn't have any water. And keep in mind, this was before Friday night when the temperatures got to real freezing conditions. And then we got this. This was a big deal, too. And uh, this was another story in the Bronx. I'll get into that. We'll just stay on topic in terms of Bronx news. A female ENT was sexually assaulted. Yeah, while responding to a, a call in the Bronx. So, a female EN, EMT was touched inappropriately. Oh, my bad. I don't know what happened. I just lost the picture there for a second. All right. And sexually assaulted by a man who flagged her down for help. EMT was responding to a scene of a massive free alarm fire that devastated seven businesses in the Soundview section. A 52-year-old man faces sex abuse charges and could be charged as a felony. So, very upsetting to hear that. Very, very upsetting. Lillian Bazion, the fire department chief of EMS, said, um, 140 firefighters were battling a three-alarm fire that tore through several businesses on Westchester Avenue in the Soundview section of the Bronx. Bazion said one responder was groped and assaulted at the scene. So, as she... As the CMT was approaching this particular person, she was assaulted inappropriately, grabbed, and held. It required the help of one of our co-workers to try to break her out of the situation. And they arrested a 52-year-old male named Aaron Carventes Mejia. He has been charged with forcible touching and sex abuse. Hmm. So they want to seek a full punishment by pressing the district attorney in the Bronx to charge him under a five-year-old law that would make an assault on an EMS worker a felony. Now, as far as the fire is concerned, the fire broke out at 6 a.m. in a 99-cent smoke. Because of heavy smoke, the MTA temporarily ordered all six trains to bypass the above-ground station at St. Louis Avenue. Thankfully, in terms of what the fire did, there were no reported injuries. But, again, there was a sexual assault on an EMT. Wow, I mean, I don't even want to know how young this person is, but... Um... No, just inappropriate, especially on the job. Really. And then we'll mention what happened in the Bronx. I'm not even going to play this video, but this got a lot of attention. I mean, every New York City outlet was covering this. I mean, I couldn't find an article online, but um, this is the only one I could find from the UK. So, um, this happened in the Bronx. So, um, I'll zoom in. You all can read this on a smartphone or a tablet. A dad was caught on video viciously punching and shaking his young children on a subway platform. Authorities have not released the man's name, but he's a 35-year-old male from Manhattan. And the two kids are his children. Yikes. They're just disgusting. This happened at Fordham Road, Jerome Avenue, in the Bronx at 9 p.m. back on Friday, January 22nd at 9 p.m. In the clip, the man can be seen repeatedly punching the older boy wearing orange in his face and chest. The child can be seen leaning away as his younger brother appears to freeze with fear. The man then turns his attention to the younger child and repeatedly grabs him violently by his hair and shakes his head. He stops for several seconds in between the attacks. The man was arrested after the day after the attack was filmed. And then just this week, the media made it a big deal because there was an online video. And uh, then, Transit Chief Kathleen O'Reilly had a tweet that we are aware of a video on social media that depicts two children on a subway platform being struck by an adult that was accompanying them. The detective squad are looking into this. So, just disgusting. 
And then, um, just this past weekend, um, the man was arrested in Manhattan for domestic abuse allegations, including allegedly striking one of the boys with a belt. So again, just disgusting. Oh, and look at this. Because of bail reform, he was let out. Why aren't I surprised? See, people like this deserve to be in jail, but no. Cuomo says, you can get out. No problem. Yep. Just disgusting. Now, again, if you saw this on the platform, why would you call 911 when there's supposed to be a help thing there? Unless it wasn't working. Wow. Look at this. This guy has a long rap sheet. Dates back almost 17 years. My bad. 18 years. Wow. Oh, three. Many include charges of domestic abuse, assault, drugs, and menacing. Wow. Let's see here. Oh, my bad. <laughs> Didn't mean to click on that. But again, just disgusting. I mean, I'm glad the media made this a big deal. I mean, this was just a very disturbing thing. Now, here's something that didn't get enough attention. Child fighting for life after being injured in a three-alarm Rockaway Beach house fire. So this happened on January 30th inside a two-story home. I mean, I don't know what happened. I was watching Channel 4 last night. How come they didn't bring this up? Look at this. It happened yesterday morning at Beach 86th Street near Rockaway Freeway and Rockaway Beach. A young child was critically injured during a three-alarm fire. According to the FDMY, the flames apparently emanated in the basement of the dwelling before spreading. 33 FDMY units and 138 firefighters responded to this incident, battling the flames and frigid conditions. Firefighters found the young child inside the burning home and rushed her out. They took the young child to St. John Episcopal Hospital. So, uh, I'm hoping this child's going to be okay. I mean, that's just scary to even hear. Uh, the good news is the fire was brought under control at 12.09 p.m. No cause was immediately determined. The fire marshals are investigating. So, uh, as you can see here, just just disturbing. Just very disturbing. You know, I, I just don't know what else is there to say. And I will mention, there was an accident on the Belt Parkway yesterday. We'll get into that later on in this video, but... Um, it was an awful accident on the Belt Parkway yesterday, and I was first notified by the 63rd Precinct because the accident happened at Flatbush Avenue. So, at least the Daily News wrote an article about it, and we'll, we'll get into that later on. And the good news is I found a way to avoid the pain wall, which I won't get into. Alright, now we're going to get into this. And I wanted to go to this story first. This is more urgent. There was an assault at Kew Gardens Union Turnpike. Yeah, you heard me correctly. Kew Gardens Union Turnpike. And I want to thank Nicole Galanis from the Manhattan Institute for making me aware of this. So let's get into this. Video shows man slug woman in New York City subway after she didn't hand over money. So we do have a video of the incident. Let's just see if we can... Uh, pull it up. So I want you all to look at this because the cur the courier didn't even write an article about this. You know, this is a big deal. One of the busiest subway stations in, in Queens. All right, so here we go. Yikes. I'm hoping this is not by the exit where the Q46 is. I mean, that's just very disturbing. Alright, so it says a beggar fractured a woman's face at a Queens subway station this week because she didn't give him any money. 63-year-old victim was waiting for a southbound E-train at the Kew Gardens Union Turnpike Station at 8.30 a.m. back on Wednesday, January 27th. The stranger asked her for some cash, cops said. Like, let me see. Yeah, thankfully this is not Isaiah. Was, I, I was worried it might be him. 
But yeah, see what I mean? I knew this was eventually going to happen with the, with the aggressive panhandling. When she declined, he punched her in the face. She was rushed to Long Island Jewish Forest Hills Hospital in stable conditions. Surveillance video shows the suspect leaving the station. He was still on the loose back on Friday. So, um, I will mention that right now, uh, personal thing I'm going to do, uh, February 25th at the next New York City Transit Riders Commuter Council during new business, I will ask Andrew Albert if he can request cops from Transit District 20 to do regular patrols. Um, I won't bring this up during the board meeting because... You know, more important things need to be discussed with the board. So I'll take that in the private matter on Zoom, of course. But again, I've been saying for years, you know, I, I've documented this. Kew Garden Union Turnpike really needs patrols. It just doesn't make any sense that Briarwood is the next station over on the F line and you can't get more cops. You know, we really need more cops. Especially if, like, let's say... You know, this is actually happening. You know, they could have at least flagged down the suspect. So, trust me, I will be bringing this up to them uh, in February. Because this is just really disgusting that this uh, happened. Alright, so now we're going to get into important other things in Astoria. Uh, I had an article later on for the weather update. Let me just see if I can find the Belt Parkway accident. Because that's, again, an urgent uh, situation. So we'll get into the other stories later on as we go along. But this is, uh, this is a very important story that happened on the Belt Parkway. So, speeding driver dies after crashing on the Belt Parkway. Now, this is a little bit too close to home for me, in a sense, because... Um, my parents' friends live in Mill Basin. They're not too far from uh, King's Plaza Mall. So, when I heard this, I literally sent the link to um, my mom's friends in Brooklyn because I was going to tell them, look, media may not cover this, but surprisingly, the Daily News actually wrote an article. So, I'll, uh, I'll get into it right now. Speeding driver died after losing control and crashing on the Belt Parkway in Brooklyn from... Um, cops from the 63rd Precinct said on Sunday. James Michael Mack was sipping west on the Belt Parkway when he lost control while navigating in a curve in the road as he approached the bridge for Garrison Inlet at 10.10 10 a.m. on Saturday morning. He crashed near Flatbush Avenue in Marine Park. So, that's Marine Park. Menick's extricated Mac from his wrecked vehicle and took him to New NYU Langone Hospital, Brooklyn. He was initially conscious and alert and believed in stable condition, but later on he had died at the hospital. So, that is just upsetting that this had to happen. I mean, first of all, I know the speed limit on the Belt Parkway. Even my dad knows the speed limit on the Belt Parkway. The speed limit is 50 miles an hour. And especially how I know those curves very well when you get to exit 8. Because I've been to Coney Island before with a friend. And, you know, what's very dangerous about the belt. And come to think of it, I've gone to Staten Island recently before the pandemic. Like, once you get past exit 8, there's nowhere to pull over. And that's why I'm always scared to go on the belt parkway. Not just that, but the Gowanus, too. I mean, I hate the elevated structure. Alright, so, um, let's move on now to other stuff. The mess continues in Northwest Queens. I mean, I don't know what is going on in Long Island City and Astoria lately, but we, we gotta get into this. And there's even a story we gotta get into in Woodside, because it's just... I mean, I always used to think that Jamaica was always the hot spot for the crime... Now it seems Northwest Queens is is starting to become that too. All right, so what happened in Astoria? A New Jersey man was arrested and charged for allegedly setting fire to his Astoria hookah bar, named Inlet Lounge. Asif Raja was charged with arson earlier this month in Brooklyn Federal Court 
after he set fire to his lounge at 30-27 Steinway Street over the summer. On August 4th of last year, firefighters were called to England after reports of a gas odor at 10.15 p.m. When they arrived, firefighters found the lounge's water sprinklers activated. They were finding several small fires throughout the lounge, according to authorities. And the good news is nobody was injured when the FDNY put the fire under control. Yep. And they did find surveillance video. Oh my god. You know, I, this is what I always talk about. Even when I used to do Queen's News before the pandemic, this is what I always used to talk about. How stupid these criminals are. So, uh... If convicted, Rajov will be sentenced to at least 5 to almost 20 years in prison. So let's just watch this video, because I'm... Again, dumb criminals in the act, right? Watch this. Watch how stupid this is. You know, if you were at least going to do that, at least turn off the cameras. I mean, how stupid can you be? Alright, we're having buffering problems. I don't know why. I do apologize. It does happen. On occasion. So let's see. He's climbing up the ladder. Oh man. I don't know what's going on with this today. Wait for it to buffer a little bit. But let's see if we can skip ahead. Okay. It seems we can't. Well, that doesn't help us. But it's a long video. Guess I can't try playing it. Oh. I forgot to mention. There's another story from the Queen's Boulevard line. FDNY rescues person who was pinned underneath the E-train in Forest Hills. Let's get into this. On Tuesday, January 6th at 5 p.m., the FDNY received reports of a person struck by a train at the 71st Avenue train stop in Forest Hills. Firefighters and EMS personally arrived at the station. They found a person pinned underneath an E-train. Power was shut down and FDMI units who were sent onto the tracks to rescue the person, according to the department. The injured person was taken to Jamaica Hospital and power to the line was restored at around 5.30 p.m. And the authorities could not expand on the condition of the person, so... Again, Queens Boulevard line. But again, I am just very disgusted to see that story earlier. Alright, so, um, let's get into this. Cop seeks shooter who fired a teen in Long Island City. The NYPD is looking for a person who shot a teenager in Long Island City on January 1st. This happened literally 15 minutes into the new year. Oh my goodness. A 17-year-old boy was sitting inside a car with three of his friends and the driver of a black BMW pulled up beside them. An unidentified person inside the BMW pulled out a firearm and then shot and then fired two shots into the other car, hitting the 17-year-old once in the left shoulder. EMS personnel arrived at the scene and took the teen to Bellevue Hospital where he was treated for his injury and released. No one else was injured. Police obtained surveillance video of the shooter's car from a nearby hotel. There have been no arrests. So, we know the deal. Oh, we don't even have a video. But I might as well get the Crime Stoppers information. So, 1-800-577-TIPS, 8477, in Espanol, 888-577-8478-7478-482. So, that's Pista. The public can also submit their tips by logging on to the Crime Stoppers website, nypdcrimestoppers.com, or on Twitter, at NYPDTips. Next up in Long Island City, cops seek suspect involved with New Year's Day shootout that sent teen to the hospital. And look at this! An hour later in the same neighborhood! <laughs> Folks, I I'm just going to say this right now. You're, you're witnessing the next crime hotspot of Queens. Do, do, do I need to say more? Alright, so on Friday, January 1st at 1.15 a.m., a group of young people were standing in front of 12 Shoulds to 37th Avenue when an unidentified man shot, fired several shots in their direction. One of the bullets hit a 19-year-old victim standing in the group, and he was a man, by the way, in the stomach, police said. 
Another man in the group fired several shots back at the unidentified man when they got into a gray infinity sedan and fled the scene southbound on 13th Street. The 19-year-old was taken to Wild Cornell Medical Center in stable condition. While police did yet to gather a description of the first shooter, the second man was last seen wearing a black hooded sweater, a red coat, black pants, and white sneakers. And no arrests. Ugh. They probably got this from a nearby building. That's what I think. Ugh. Oh, and look at this! We have a robbery in Astoria! So here we go. On Thursday, January 21st at 9.30 a.m., an unidentified man walked into a Citibank branch at 22 at 1631st Street. The man who was wearing a face mask, beanie cap, and hard hat walked up to the 26-year-old teller and handed him a note demanding cash. The teller then gave the robber around $600 in cash. The man then fled the bank on foot and headed northbound on 31st Street. The good news is we do have surveillance video of the suspect. Let's see if this one actually loads. Okay, there we go. And that's the problem. I'm not going to find them that easily, but... Wow. I just want to see where this bank is located. Because I'm not going to look up any other address that was from the other articles. Ah, oh, right by Dittmar's. Okay. Hookah bar raid in Woodside. Yep. Like I figured, you know when there's an illegal COVID party, the sheriff's office is going to show up. So this happened at Roosevelt Avenue. So, uh, look what would have happened. There was carbon monoxide in the building. You know, I'm, this is lengthy. I'm not going to read it, but look how disturbing this is. I mean, there were people wearing masks, but still, you can't be having, the rule is you can't have more than 10 people in an indoor gathering. All right, so let's get into this. This is disturbing to read. Teen arrested in connection with string of robberies at Flushing Park. This happened at Casino Park. Ah. This was a 16-year-old kid. So they thankfully did arrest him. Uh, grand larceny and criminal possession of stolen property. Alright, so the first robbery was on Friday, January 8th at 1 p.m. when one of the suspects ran up to a 21-year-old woman at Casino Corridor Park and snatched her phone from her hand. The teen ran out of the park into a gold Toyota Camry. The next week on Monday, January 11th at 5.50 p.m., two teens approached a 58-year-old man into the park. They demanded his hand over his money and then punched him in the face before reaching into his pocket and then his wallet, which contained $70 in cash and a gift card. Later that week, on January 15th at 2.20 p.m., three teens attacked an 18-year-old man as he was riding his bike through the park. According to police, after knocking the teen off the bike, the trio stole his wallet, which had $23 in cash and a debit card inside. And look at this! They approached a 59-year-old man minutes later, punched him in the face, and stole his wallet, which had $150. And then look at this. They found the debit card being used at Dominic's Pizza in Jamaica. Police say all three individuals are de between the ages of 16 and 19 year old, so... Few of them could be charged as a juvenile, and then a couple other of them could be charged as adults. And, take a look at this. Shooting in Far Rockaway. Police are searching for a suspect. Oh. Who robbed a man and shot at him while he was attempting to pursue him in Far Rockaway. 
On January 19th, a 64-year-old man was getting out of his car at Beach 45th Street and Beach Channel Drive when he was approached by an unidentified man. The man pulled out a silver gun, pointing it at the victim, and demanded his money. The suspect then reached into the man's pocket, stealing his wallets, which almost had around $120 inside. As the thief took off on foot towards Beach 44th Street, the victim hopped into his car and began to follow the man. The man then took out his gun and fired several shots towards the 64-year-old's car, hitting the vehicle several times. Then the 64-year-old followed the suspect, who continued to flee on scene. So they do have pictures of the suspect. He's between 20 and 30 years old. Well, at least that's a clear picture. He wasn't even wearing a mask. <laughs> Oof. Dumb criminals, right? We always keep talking about. Alright, two more stories. Um, I'll just keep the courier website in another tab. Police shoot suspect car theft in Jamaica as he attempted to ram into an NYPD fan. A suspected car theft is, in, is hospitalized in stable condition after police in Jamaica shot him in the chest. And he allegedly attempted to ram them in the vehicle on Sunday night, January 24th. Police officers said the suspect and a 21-year-old male accomplice initially stole the vehicle, a 2004 Acura, in front of a home at 101st Avenue near 126th Street in South Richmond Hill at 9.35 p.m. on January 24th. The shooting occurred a short time later in Jamaica along 97th Street between Allendale and Liverpool Street, Sean Bell Way, where officers from the 102nd Precinct had tracked the stolen Acura, according to Chief of Patrol Juanita, William, well, Juanita Holmes. Excuse me. The vehicle had told police... Oh, the victim had told police he left his keys in the car, as well as a cell phone inside the vehicle when it was stolen. Officers were able to ascertain the Acura's location by tracing the cell phone. According to Holmes, the officers went to Jamaica location in the 103rd confines and spotted the stolen Acura. Ooh, and look at this. There was a high-speed chase. The suspect accelerated in a reverse at a high-speed rate into a marked vehicle. One of the a suspect stitched charged his firearm and struck a 28 year old man in a chest. The wounded suspect, who sat in the police passenger seat, was brought to Jamaica Hospital. And they thankfully brought in the 21 year old man, who was a the suspect. They bore him into custody without further incidents. And the good news is, police officers were taken to a hospital, were evaluated, and then released. And they're looking into what the charges are going to be. Oh, look at this. The shooting occurred near Liverpool Street, which was renamed for Sean Bell. Ah, oh, You cannot make this stuff up. All right, then let's get into this sad story from Midtown. Elderly woman and her 64-year-old son found dead in their luxury Manhattan home. I mean, this is just sad to even hear. Elderly woman and her 64-year-old son were found dead in their luxury Chelsea apartment. Cops showed up to do a wellness check at the Tate Building on West 23rd Street near 10th Avenue. Saturday after a relative hadn't heard from the victims and grew concerned. Police found William Weddle dead in a bedroom and his 92-year-old mother, Agnes Weddle, dead on a couch. At least one of the bodies had started to decompromise. Yikes. That is just very disturbing to hear that that happened in Midtown. Okay, so, that being all said, we are going to wrap up this video. So, we will have a storm update later tonight. Uh... Very concerning to hear that while the crime is getting out of hand during the pandemic, we're going to have a winter storm. It might convert into a blizzard. So, uh, more to come on that later tonight. Uh, so, with that, thank you all for watching. Until the next one, please take care.